is an email from Jessica. This is really good. She writes, Growing up, I had many spiritual encounters. I spent most of my young life absolutely terrified. I've often thought of writing a book about all the experiences I've had, but I learned very quickly to keep them to myself. Once I finally moved out of the house and grew up, the experiences stopped. None of those experiences pertain to Bigfoot. They were all centered on ghosts and spirits. I'm 36 years old now, and to this day, I'm still terrified of the dark. I removed every closet door in my house the day we closed on it. I'm not ashamed to say that I still have to sleep with a nightlight on in my room, the bathroom light on, and the light over the stove on unless it burns out. If it gets dark outside and there's still laundry to be hung, I'll leave it until the next morning. And I'm grateful for my husband. I've told him everything, and whether or not he believes me, I'll never know. But he's never laughed at me or told me that I'm crazy, and nor has he ever made me think he doesn't believe me. He's a very understanding of my needs when it comes to the closet doors and such. As for Bigfoot, I had never thought about it. Nobody ever talked about it while I was growing up, so it never crossed my mind until a few years ago when I stumbled across a Bigfoot Encounter podcast. Immediately, I became obsessed, utterly and completely obsessed. I believe all of them. I know what it's like to experience something and not be believed, and it really sucks. Now I've watched all the shows and documentaries and encounter stories. Last week, my husband and I took our boys, who were also obsessed with Bigfoot, by the way, on vacation to the panhandle of Florida. It was the middle of nowhere, and it was pure bliss to visit the springs and the beaches that we hadn't been before. We were driving down the road with no houses around, there were no other cars, and there wasn't any cell service, and there was nothing for miles and miles when my husband turned around to face the back seat so he could talk to the boys about something. I was driving and staring at the road ahead of us when I saw this massive, unbelievably large thing dart across the road a few hundred yards in front of me. It was too far ahead for us to get any details, but I knew immediately what it was. It was so enormous, but it moved so fast. And the way it moved, I knew it was a Bigfoot. I immediately yelled for everyone to look, but it was moving so quickly that neither my husband nor my boys were able to see it. And by the time we got to the place in the road where it had crossed, it was nowhere to be found. The woods are thick there, and it was as if they had swallowed it up. It had completely vanished. I know this wasn't the best of encounters, but I like to think that it was God's way of blessing me with a tiny glimpse of what is really out there. I've been dreaming excessively about it since that day. It replays over and over in my head. My husband and my oldest son, who was eight, were disappointed they didn't get to see it too, but I feel grateful. I've spent the last few years in the woods hoping for an encounter. And I finally got one. Oh, Jessica, that's cool. I, that's that's how I want to see a Bigfoot. I've said it a million times, but I I don't want to walk up one, on one in the woods, and I don't want I don't want to look down out of a deer stand or out of a turkey blind on the ground and a Bigfoot be standing there. I want to be in my car, and I want it to be a hundred, hundred fifty two, three hundred yards away, and I see something cross the road. And I know it's a Bigfoot. That's how I want to see one. And I'm a little bit like you. I'm a little apprehensive that I would tell anybody about it because they'd all say I was crazy. All my buddies would say I'm crazy. Well, they already think I'm crazy, but I I don't know what I would do. I might tell y'all. I might tell the audience here that I saw one. This was a great story. And this wasn't action-packed, but these are so interesting. And she did a great job writing it. So thanks, Jessica. This email's from Scott. This is another good one. Hope you guys enjoy this. When I was 11, we lived on the outskirts of town with a six-foot-wide irrigation ditch that ran along the back of our property. Whenever my friends weren't around to play with, I liked to get on my metallic green Schwinn Stingray and ride down the ditch road for about four miles or so until I got to a country road, and then I'd turn and ride back. I love making that little trip. 
Wild grass grew waist-high on both sides of the ditch with groves of ponderosa pine all around and sections of volcanic lava rock here and there. Along with all these trees and all kinds of plants that grew around them, there was never a shortage of wildlife. Birds were all around and snakes were always slithering in and out of the ditch or along the path. And frogs croaked and jumped about in the water where the tadpoles were busy turning themselves into more frogs. I'd see water skippers and even the occasional mule deer on those rides. It was one of those hot summer days when all of my friends were busy doing something else when I decided to go exploring down that ditch road. I had reached my turnaround point and I was headed back home when I heard a noise coming from a large tree on the other side of the ditch. Well, I was curious to know what was making the sound, so I stopped my bike and I looked up into the tree. It only took a minute to locate the creature. It was obvious. It looked like a large monkey about my size sitting up on the branches. As soon as this thing saw that I was looking at it, it shimmied around to the other side of the tree. Well, I wanted to see more of it, so I started trying to walk up and down the road to see around the tree, but it kept moving with me. I could still see its hands on the trunk, but I couldn't get around fast enough to see anything else. It was on the other side of the ditch, so I couldn't walk around the tree itself. I grew tired of the game that we were playing pretty fast, so I got on my bike and I rode back home. And when I got there, I told my mother what I had seen, but she laughed and she said I had a very good imagination. Later, when I told my friends about it, they all accused me of spinning yarns. Well, I was upset that I couldn't make anyone believe me, so after a while, I quit talking about it. It wasn't until years later that I realized I had seen a young Sasquatch, or squ- uh, squ- a Squatchlet, I think he writes here. I'm certain that the mother must have been in the area, and I guess I'm lucky that she didn't view my curiosity as a threat. You know, the thing that... Uh, jumps out in so many of these stories is that people try to tell other people what they had seen and they eventually just quit talking about it because nobody believes them. But I guess that's just part of the further course. Uh, If you've seen something and you tell people and they either laugh at you or don't believe you, shake it off. You know, it's just part of it. Don't talk about it anymore. Probably because the more you talk about it, uh, the more you realize that they could care less and the more you realize that The more you talk about it, the more silly you look. So just, you know, maybe keep it to yourself and maybe one day they'll see one and come to you. But this was a good good story, Scott. I appreciate you sending it. Okay, I think this story is from a gentleman who is from India. I think that's right. Uh, We're going to read and find out if he says, but I think from some of the words he uses, uh, it sounds Indian to me. So... I don't know. It's hard for me to pick up those Eastern languages. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. But he asked me not to use his name. And I'll say this. He says his English is not very good, but Neoma, who edited this for me, says that she didn't have to change but one or two words. So he has a very good command of the English language. But let's hear what he writes. Most people know about the Yeti or the Nepali Bigfoot, but we have another creature here known as the Ban Zachri. Now, Ban means forest and Zachri means shaman. These creatures are said to be covered entirely with hair except for the palms of their hands and their faces and the soles of their feet, and they resemble men more than apes. There's only one main difference between a Bigfoot and a Ban Zachri, and that's their height. While a Bigfoot is known to stand eight feet tall or more, a Banzachri is only three to five feet tall. Their hair is reddish or goldish brown, so you could call them a small yeti. According to legend, they live in forests and caves and they kidnap young candidates, typically between the ages of seven and twenty, to initiate into shamanism. Only those youths who are pure in body and heart are retained for teaching. Ideally, the time they spend teaching them is about 30 days, and then they are returned to the place from which they are initially abducted. Candidates with physical scars or who do not have pure hearts are released quickly. Often they are violently thrown from the Banzachri's cave, and if they're lucky, 
They will not be captured by his ferocious wife, the Ban Zacharina, <laughs> who will eat them. Woo. Like the Yeti, there's an extensive oral mythology surrounding the Ban Zachary, but because there's little to no public interest, there's no written text that I'm aware of. They are said to be invisible to the human eye, but they can make themselves invisible if they want and they have been known to beat shepherds or travelers who are resting in the jungle to avoid the heat. In some instances, they will even throw them down the hills. And when the shepherd opens his eyes after a beating, he will see them, but only few, for a few seconds. There are also stories of the creature taking the milk of cows so that people would often sleep near their cows at night and chase them away. Because people can't see them, they have to listen for the sucking noise. And then they swing sticks in front of the cows and the udders and hit the creatures, causing them to scream horribly. The creatures are often heard whistling and howling in the night or from the hills above as the villagers work in the fields. These whistles are frequently answered from the opposite hill. When people find the remains of crabs or the intestines of frogs near the entrance of a cave, they say the Banzachri lives there because they often eat those little things. But they are omnivorous creatures who also eat from the many fruit trees and wild edible roots in the hills of Nepal. And it's sad that so many people know about the Yeti, but so few have heard about the Banzachri. Oh, that's interesting. For India, I, Is this from Nepal or India? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't even know where Nepal is in reference to India. I need to, I'm a moron when it comes to geography. I know where a few, a few countries are, but I could look this up. But this, this is really interesting. I love to hear these stories from people from other countries who have the same legends and mysteries that we do here in North America. And uh, if there's anyone out there from another country listening, we've gotten a few from Australia on the Yowie and I think we've had some from the Philippines. We've had some from South America. We've had some stories from Europe. I guess Russia, China, some of those countries that we don't communicate well, well, with very much. I haven't heard anything from them. I did see a story one time on a, I think it was in China. This could have been Nepal too, but it was like a human, but he was huge. He was like this giant guy and he... Uh, he wasn't hairy, but he looked like an ape. It was amazing. I think it's probably a birth defect or something. But all that to say, I really love these stories from other places around the globe. So if you live somewhere else, and it doesn't have to be a Bigfoot type creature, it could be a ghost or a, I don't know. I'd love to get stories about the Banshee from Ireland, from Irish people. I'd love to hear stories about ghosts from England and the UK and Scotland. I think the Welch have a few really cool stories. They have they have uh, paranormal stuff going on. Norway, up in Norway, where the uh, where all the blonde-haired Swedes live, there's there's all kind of uh, mythical creatures that supposedly live in, in that area. I would love to hear from anybody who has anything. Just send me an email to dixiecrypted at gmail dot com. I'd love to hear from you. Anyway. This man is a good writer. He doesn't have a good command of English, but he did a great job. I appreciate you. This is an email from John. This is very intriguing to me. Uh, you guys let me know what you think in the comment section. It's a little bit about religion. I might make some commentary on that at the end, but I'm just going to read it to you the way he sent it to me. Here's what John writes. In 1978, when I was at... Oh, can't even get my mouth to work here. In 1978, when I was eight years old, we went to one of those old-fashioned, fire-breathing Pentecostal church meetings that scared me to the core. The church was new, and so was the building. It was mostly block with no paint or air conditioning. No place on earth ever feels so close to hell as the inside of a church building on a hot summer day when the preacher is spewing fire and brimstone with every verse he quotes. The man at the pulpit that day was an older evangelist who was speaking on the future events and the end times. He had me on the edge of my seat, not knowing whether to run or hide or sit and listen. My dad's belt held me firm, I guess. 
His primary subject was the second coming of Christ, but he talked about things that no one could have known back then. Everything we have today, he touched on, even how folks would act. And then he said it would be like unto the days of Noah, and there would be monsters and rumors of monsters. If he was trying to scare me, he was about as successful as a man can be. And I've never forgotten his sermon all these years later. And I understand now how Satan wants to be God, so he tries to create things like God, but he never quite gets it right because he lacks the ability to give things a soul. And that's how bloodlines get tainted. There is one area called the Green Swamp where I like to hunt. Back when I was 18, I hunted there alone quite a bit. One morning, I was out on a a powder grade close to the northern fence line. I'd walked several miles, and I decided it was time to have a rest. I found a spot where I could look out over at least 100 acres of cleared land where the palmettos were coming back through the charred earth and were about a foot high. Bayhead swamps are pretty dry. Most only have an inch of water or so. I was looking out over the landscape when I saw what I took to be an otter. I've had a lot of years to think about that, and I've come to realize that no otter that far away could ever look that big. And where he was heading, there was no major water source for miles. But I was pretty sure there were deep fire breaks cut with the big turn plows in that direction. They create ditches, and they're up to two feet deep on one side. At the time, I wrote about what I saw, and I put it down as an otter that looked more like a sea lion doing a watermelon crawl at a pretty good pace. Now that I realize it couldn't have been an otter, I've tried to figure out what it was. No pig would crawl like that for over 100 yards. I guess I'll never know what it was. I had another incident a mile from there while I was hunting with my brother-in-law, It was an afternoon hunt with me in the stand on one side of the road and him on the other. Between the heat and the mosquitoes, I wasn't having much fun and he was a good mile away, so I started thinking about riding home when something screamed so loud it darn near made me fill my pants. It sounded like some lady was out there getting killed. A million thoughts went through my mind as I climbed down out of that stand. Should I get down and help her, I thought. It wasn't my fault that she was out there in the middle of nowhere. While my mind was telling me that I ought to be brave and go help that poor woman, my feet were already carrying me to my truck. I was half a mile from it when I realized whatever was making that sound was not human, and it was only about 50 yards away from me now. I kicked my 18-year-old legs into overdrive, and I got myself back to the truck. Of course, my brother-in-law didn't hear it, so I had to endure a lot of teasing from him over it. This area has had a lot of sightings, and a lot of people have come out to investigate. These woods have it all, from old river basins and swamp to sandhill pines, so I'm not surprised. Once I was fishing on the east side of Crescent Lake in Florida when we started hearing a loud noise coming from the bank and we looked up in time to see a huge ten-point buck jump into the water at full speed. He had at least a two-mile swim ahead of him, and he wasn't wasting time getting there. We didn't think much of it until the next year when we learned that he'd come out of the water at the other end and ran ran through several neighborhoods, and then he went right on downtown. Considering how far he swam to get there and the three or four miles of running he did once he got out, I think something must have spooked him pretty bad. I'm just glad whatever it was didn't come out of the woods and come after us. After 30 years of connecting the dots and applying them to what that evangelist said that day, I have some theories on what Bigfoot and dogmen and even aliens are. I believe they will all tie into the time of the rapture. For now, I believe no Christian can be hurt by them, But as we get closer and closer to the end of days, we will see more and more of them, and I truly believe, Christians at least, will all come to realize how truly demonic some of these creatures are. Well, I don't know. I better just hold my tongue on these Pentecostal charismatic 
<laughs> evangelist, man, they get they get so carried away. I've actually heard some of them. One time when I was uh, I, I was tw- I was twelve or thirteen, and I I went to a private school in Memphis uh, at that time. Busing had started, and my dad he hated it. He didn't he did not want us kids riding the bus halfway across Memphis just to go to another school because it was a political cultural thing to do, which I had nothing to do with that. I just went wherever my folks told me to go. So we went to a private school. Well, at that time, uh, all the private schools in Memphis were just loaded up with people. You couldn't get into one. And so they got us into a school that was uh, it's just the first one they could find to get us into. And uh, it was a good school. I like going to school there, but we it was a it was a church school. It was a school started by a local charismatic church. I think it was the Assemblies of God denomination. And we would have these uh, assemblies on Wednesday that I think they called it chapel. I was not a particularly religious person. I wasn't raised in a religious home, and I'm not religious now. I remember the speaking in tongues thing, and all the kids who went to church there, they went to church and the school. Man, they at the end of these services, they would have these, uh, I think they call them altar calls, and these kids would start jibber-jabbering and stuff like that. And I remember thinking... I, I want to see if I can do that. So I, you would go into another room. It was like a prayer room. And I'm not criticizing any of this. I'm just, so please don't think that's where I'm going. But I thought I'd go in there. And I actually tried it two or three times. I even went on Wednesday night to the church services to see what it was all about with some friends. And I would go into the prayer room. And I tried and tried and tried to, to do that jibber-jabber language. And I couldn't do it. And finally, this... uh this evangelist that was in town, I would say his name, <laughs> but he was a, he was an ex professional football player and he had turned evangelist and he was in that charismatic movement. And he came around, he was going around talking to people and he was like touching them and they would start shaking and they would talk in tongues and all this stuff. And he was coming to me and I was like, all right, man, here we go. And we'll get to do this. And uh, he got in front of me and he, he prayed and he kind of sm- he kind of popped me on the head and nothing. And he goes, you, you're going to, you're going to speak in tongues. Do you really want to speak in tongues? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want to. He tapped me on the head again and nothing. I just sat there and looked at him. He goes, can you feel it? Is it coming? Is the Holy spirit going to consume you? And I'm like, I don't think so. And he moved on to another person and there were four or five of us guys there that kind of hung around together. And it was the same one with all of us. And I just thought it was funny, but, uh, I'm not criticizing it. I've just never talked in tongues. There are some people who are not in charismatic denominations who believe that the people that do speak in tongues, that it's genuine. I don't really know. I really don't know. And I don't quite understand the purpose of it. I know that it's a thing that happened in the book of Acts. And my personal belief is that it uh, went on in the early church and it was there to be a sign for other people to know that Christians were set apart. There's a whole theology behind all of the, it's the gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that people would just eat me alive explaining it to me. And that's, I'm not getting into a religious discussion here, but that was my experience with a uh, charismatic evangelist. And I've always looked back on it and kind of laughed at it. He couldn't get me to talk in tongues. But this was a great story, and I, I don't know about the end of times. I don't think anybody knows anything. Uh, there's a lot of theories around about how it's all going to go down, but I don't think any of us really know. I think we just need to look for the one who came and paid the debt for us, and that's good enough. I think that's good enough. John, thank you for that story. It was awesome. Okay, this man doesn't say whether to use his name or not, so I won't, but here's what he writes. My property butts up against a 6,550-acre state park. There's a 3,360-acre lake in the park created by a dam that I can see from my backyard. Around late December, the park was like a ghost town. 
There are always a few diehard hikers and a few people who walk their dogs on the roads and the trails, but mostly it's empty and devoid of activity. I'm a Bigfoot researcher and I had a strong feeling about a spot in one of the empty picnic areas. I had occasionally caught eye shine there that I knew wasn't from a deer. Their eyes glow orange. It was too scattered to be a raccoon or any other small critter, so I decided to try and draw out whatever was back there. I have a very bright headlamp with a red strobe light on it that I thought might pique their curiosity. So one night, around 11 p.m., I drove out to the picnic area, turned off my car and all my lights, and I began to red strobe the woods. Periodically, I switched the strobe to spotlight to see if anything was looking. I didn't see anything until about the fourth time. I switched the spotlight and turned it on a small hollow that was back in the trees, and I couldn't believe what I was looking at. There were at least 14 pairs of eyes looking my way. Now, some were real high, and some were mid-tree height, and a few were low to the ground. The two higher groups periodically moved behind what I assumed was a tree, and then they peered out again. The lower ones blinked every now and then, but otherwise they stayed right where they were. I felt an intense fear come over me that I couldn't explain. I was watching those eyes to my left, but to my right were dense woods that made me feel exposed. Now, leaving seemed like the right thing to do at that moment. Naturally, I couldn't let it go, so the next night, I went back to the area with my strobe light, and I repeated the technique that I had used the night before. This time, I didn't see anything where I had searched before, but to the left of that, I saw two large red circles glowing. I focused the light on them, but they stayed consistent. There was no blinking or movement of any kind. It must have been something the park placed there, I thought. Maybe it was a grill or a trash can with red reflectors on it, but why hadn't I seen it the night before? My curiosity was up, so I watched them intently, waiting for some sort of movement, and finally, they went out and then came right back on. They were eyes. I was absolutely certain they had to be eyes, but they were so big and far apart, and I continued to watch them, but they didn't blink again. I kept staring, and they kept staring back. I estimate that it was 150 feet away, so my headlamp wasn't so bright enough to make out a figure. And as I sat there watching those eyes, that feeling that I needed to leave came over me again. It shocked me because I hadn't heard anything, it was totally silent, but it was powerful enough that it couldn't be ignored. Now, I'm not suicidal, so I left, and as I drove around the circle of the parking lot, I kept my light fixed on those eyes, and they never moved. The next day, I decided that this was something to be investigated further, so I went into the woods during the day, and I found a lot of tree talk. This is to say, I found a lot of things they assemble out of tree branches and sticks. They were all wound together and held close into amazingly complex structures. Well, at this point, I was convinced that I was not seeing a normal animal's eyes shine. I started to think that there must be a community of Bigfoot or something back in those woods. And by red strobing the trees, I had gotten them all wound up. I figured the red-eyed thing was not happy about it, but this was way too close to what I looked for to let it be. That night, I went back, and this time, I brought a very powerful flashlight with me. With the window rolled down, I began to scan the tree line again, but at first, I didn't see anything. And then, out of nowhere, I spotted two large, very deep red eyes peeking around from behind a tree. They were a lot larger and redder than the eyes I had seen previously, and they were a lot further apart. I kept my light on them, and I watched in amazement as they shifted from one side of the tree to the other. And soon, they started to come farther out from behind the tree and move forward. And then they would move back to the tree and look out again from side to side. Now, whatever it was, it was emitting a feeling of intense anger and frustration, and even with a more powerful light, I couldn't make out more than a dark, hulking form. Its shoulders were massive, 
They were six feet up of the tree it was behind, but it came out and it rushed forward and it looked much taller. It was definitely extremely angry with me for causing such pandemonium in its group, and it wanted to rush me, but it didn't because of the consequences of that action might bring. The anger it was projecting was overwhelming, and I decided I had caused enough grief for this group, so I slowly pulled away and left the area, keeping my light on just in case. Since that night, I've only been back out there during the day, and I've gone into the woods, but from a different point. Once, I heard, just for a second, some samurai chatter, and even though I quickly turned my head, I never saw anything. The chatter was followed by the most violent and loud wood knocks across the other side of the woods that I have ever heard. This whole thing has been quite an adventure. One more thing. Bigfoot isn't the only strange creature in those woods. Recently, my friend and I witnessed a family of water creatures that kept moving in and out of the water and watching us. And then there was a day that I was watching four does in my backyard and something shot out of the woods like a bullet and took off after the biggest doe. It could only have been a dog man. It moved so fast that it was just a blur and it seemed to pull itself along by its front arms, not legs, arms. It moved so fast that the other three deer watched the other doe run, but they never ran. They just stood there as if to say, what got into Mabel? Oh, that was a good story. You know, it is rare, very, very rare that I get emails from genuine Bigfoot researchers. I Honestly, I don't think many of the real Bigfoot researchers like me very much because they think I make up all these stories and put them up. But this is actually an email from a Bigfoot researcher, and this is a this is a fascinating story. I I mean, and it's, it seems credible to me. He goes out night after night after night. He's not claiming any spectacular things that seem unbelievable. It seems quite believable to me. I mean, this thing, you know, it didn't attack him. He didn't actually see the full detail of the creature. He's very, very descriptive on what he saw, and he's looking for patterns is what he is, and he's trying to find out where they are and and what they're doing. So I want to tell this researcher, thank you for sending this. This is very interesting, and I appreciate it. The man who sent this email absolutely wants to be anonymous, but here's what he writes. My father has told me this story many times in my life. He said it happened when he was 10 years old, so that would have been around 1958. Back then, he would often go hunting with my grandfather in what he called Bodcow Bottoms. I assume that's what's known as Bodcow Wildlife Management Area east of Shreveport, Louisiana. My grandfather would park on an old dirt road, and they'd each head out on opposite sides of the road to hunt and then they'd meet back at the truck around noon unless one of them shot a deer. Now listen, you folks from around Shreveport, Bodcow, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's the way it's going to be in this podcast, so let's get back to the story. One morning, they parked as usual, and Dad headed to his favorite stump a few hundred yards away. There was only moonlight to the lightest way, but otherwise it was pretty dark out. As he reached the stump, he heard something rustling in the thick brush nearby. That was a good sign, he thought. Maybe it was a deer. He quietly settled down on the stump and began to prepare himself for a successful day. And then the smell hit him. It was a nasty, wet dog, skunky smell that was overwhelming enough to reach down into his throat and tickle his gag reflex. Dad jumped up and spun around looking for the source of the odor, he scanned the brush all around him until he saw a pair of glowing red eyes 15 feet away. They were six feet off the ground, but whatever they were attached to was hidden in the thick brush. He could make out a vague form, but nothing else. He stood there staring at those eyes for a second, trying to figure out what he was looking at, and before he could decide what it was, it growled a low, menacing growl at him. That was enough for Dad. The hunt was over, as far as he was concerned, and he beat a quick retreat back to the truck. Later, when my grandfather returned to the truck, he found my dad sleeping in the locked cab. My grandfather was a no-nonsense World War II Marine. He wasn't amused by my dad's explanation for his shortened hunt, 
and they relied heavily on game they hunted and the food they grew themselves to feed the family. But in his eyes, Dad had fallen short of his duties. Dad never saw more than a pair of eyes and a large shadow, but that and the awful smell were enough to convince him of what it was. He's been gone for nearly seven years now, and what I wouldn't give to hear him tell that story to me one more time. I love spending time with my father outdoors, and some of my greatest memories are from those times. In the late 1970s, Dad and one of my uncles leased a property for deer hunting in northeast Texas. I was probably five or six at the time. The cabin on the lease sat on a hill with a large field around it that was in turn surrounded by woods as far as I could see. Dad and my uncle would get up early to hunt and they would leave me and my cousin at the cabin to sleep or play. My cousin thought it was great to sleep in on the screened-in porch at night. We'd sit up all night with our backs to the wall listening to the howls and screams and yells that my uncle insisted were coming from the Boggy Creek Monster. Years later, I figured that we were probably hearing coyotes. Whatever it was, it sure made the nighttime trips to the outhouse interesting. I had never had an actual run-in with Bigfoot or Dogman or any other cryptid when I was out in the woods, but I did have one thing happen to me. It isn't as exciting as a cryptid encounter, but I'll never forget it. Sometime in the mid-1980s, I was visiting my aunt and uncle in Bossier City for a few weeks to spend time with my cousins. I passed my four-year-old cousin's room as I was walking down the back hallway on my way to the bathroom. The light was on and there were toys scattered all over the floor, and sitting in the middle of those toys with a toy truck between his legs was a shadow in the perfect shape of a little boy. I stopped and gasped when I saw it, which made it look up at me, and then it vanished right before my eyes. I was excited to be able to say I saw a ghost. My aunt later told me that a small boy who lived in the house years earlier had gotten sick and died in that room. She was always a kidder, so I have no idea if that story is true or not, but I know what I saw. That is a great little series of stories. Now, he's never run into a Bigfoot, but his father, and he loved his daddy. I mean, you can just hear it in the way he writes. Uh, He loves his father, and he misses his dad, and he remembers those stories in great detail. I get that. I miss my dad. My dad died back in, I can't even remember what year he died, 07, 06 or 07 maybe. I love my dad. I love spending time with him. I could tell all kind of stories he told me. But they're not they're not monster stories, so I probably won't share them here. And then he sees a ghost, and I love these ghost stories. Oh, I, it, please send ghost stories if you have them. They're so interesting. I know for five years this channel has been all about monsters and Bigfoots and dogmen, but 95% of the stories are about Bigfoot. But I love the ghost stories, so if you guys, please send me ghost stories. I love them. Or, or any anything creepy, anything weird is interesting to me, and I'll put it on the podcast, I guarantee you. So uh, anyway, thanks to the gentleman who wishes to be anonymous to uh, for sending this because it was an awesome set of stories. I really appreciate it. All right, thanks for listening to this podcast. I really appreciate you. You know, you guys can also listen on a podcast app if you have an apple phone or an andro android phone where you can use spotify any of the uh, iheart any of the other podcast apps switch over there hey any of you apple users a good review would be awesome i don't use apple products so i don't know what it looks like but i hear other podcasters say that if you'll leave a good review it helps with the apple ratings not sure how that works but if you're using apple podcast maybe leave me a good review five star thumbs up whatever apple podcast does i'd appreciate that all right you guys have a good one and we'll uh, hopefully i'll have another one up this week thanks see you next time